What up? Oh, worked. What's going on, Ryan? Good family. What's happening? I'm good. Appreciate you for taking the time out to join us for Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, man. Absolutely. We feel like you're one of those people that, you know, when they hear the music, they'll know the work that you've done. But I think we got to highlight all of it just for the people that don't know, you know, what, what you've been up to since, you know, your City High days and even before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, man. I mean, Absolutely. how you want to do it? Where you want to begin? <laughs> well, we got to start from the beginning. You know, I was looking at your credits and I didn't even know this. And this might be common knowledge to some people, but you did a lot of work on one of the Will Smith projects early on in your career. Yeah, yeah, the uh, Big Willie style album, the album that had uh, Getting Jiggy With It on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah talk about that era. That, that I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was, so that was, uh, that was, that was, man, 97, that was like 98, 99. Um, so that was about five years after Sister Act had uh, came out, Sister Act 2 came out or whatever. And um, I was actually in a, in a, in a pretty, pretty low state base little low spot in my life because um mm -hmm. you know contrary to popular belief sister act two was actually considered a box office flop you see what i'm saying oh wow compared to the first one because the first one did like 250 million in the box office so the sure. second one only did about 50 million in the box office so it's like oh well it didn't do good right but the yeah. difference is sister act two gained so much momentum and a cult following as it started playing on tv and you know what I mean? So, uh, so yeah, so it was like five years after the movie and um, I, I kind of, I was in a, I was in a tricky spot in my life. I didn't really have another uh, big, any, any big acting things going on. And I kind of, I was trying to get a record deal. I was having a, a, a time, a hard time getting a record deal. I was signed to um, Jazzy Jeff's uh, Touch of Jazz, oh. a Touch of Jazz uh, production company down in Philly. Um, nice. And so, yeah, I was working on a project. I was working on my album back then, and 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 uh, I was singing and rapping on my songs. And believe it or not, I couldn't get a record deal because of that. Record companies were afraid wow. to sign an artist that could sing and rap. It was all. It oh was, wow. Like, it was weird. Yes, back then it was like the cool thing to do. So yeah. the record labels were like, "Oh man, he needs to pick a lane. It's confusing." You know what I mean? Versus now, twenty years later, every every rapper can sing and rap, and you know what I'm saying. So so yeah, so I had all these songs where I was singing and rapping on them. And um, Jazzy, I mean, uh, Will Smith had just finished, uh, well, he did the Men in Black, it came out that summer. And, yeah. you know, that was a big, huge hit. And so Will, he had big success with the Here Comes the Men in Black song off the soundtrack. So he came down to his boy, you know, Jeff is his best friend. So he's like, yo, man, I want to do a whole comeback album. And he's like, I know you got some yeah. music for me. And Jeff played him my stuff because my stuff had rapping and, you know, had raps on right. it. Yeah. So Will was like, you know, he heard he heard some of my songs and he's like, yo, who's that rapping? And, oh, man, it's this kid I got named Ryan. And then yeah. the chorus will come on and I'm singing the hook. And he's like, who's that wow. kid on the chorus? It's like, yo, that's the same kid. He's like, what? Like, you know, <laughs> so Will just, you know, he immediately like fell in love with my sound. And um, he wanted to record a couple of the songs that I that I actually had that was for my project. And so Jeff called me. He told me Will wanted to record some of the songs. And um, we got in the studio. We met. Uh, we hit it off right away. Will was a great guy, and uh, we we started recording some songs. And then Will was like, um, after we finished the first one, Will was like, "Yo, man," I'm, he said, "You you know, I really like the chemistry we had." He was like, "You want to write me another one?" I was like, "Yeah, sure." So we did another one right there on the spot. And then uh, after that, um, that day was over. And then Will was like, "Yo, man, um, I'm going out to L.A. to go work with like Warren G. and Nate Dogg and Stu." <laughs> he's like, "You you want to come? You want to come? You know, work with me with that?" I was like, "Sure." Like, when you when you when you going? He's like, "Tonight." <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that was my that was my first introduction into like private jet life, and you could just leave when you want and just go get on the plane wow. and just you know what I mean. So yeah, so that's how that came about, and so. We worked with, we did some work in LA, and then from there we flew to New York. We did some work with uh, the track masters, Tone and Polk. And yep. that's, that's, that's when we did the song, uh, Welcome to Miami. That was one of the yeah. songs we did, working with Tone and Polk. And yeah, that album went on to, you know, sell like 22 million copies, man. So it was a big success for me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the track Miami, I feel like, you know, if, you, if it didn't come out the right way, it could have uh, it would have been proceeded to look as corny, but yeah. I don't know what you guys did with it, but it was just a, such a cool, laid back party type of record. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, that whole album could have been yeah. a hit or miss because, you know, yeah. at that stage in Will's career, he, you know, he was he had finished being the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you know, and then he he started to become the big time summer blockbuster 
you know, movie star. But yeah. but then he wanted to do an album and it was kind of like, you know, this is during the Puff Daddy era, the Jay-Z Rockefeller Wu-Tang era. So it was kind of like, you know, Will Smith, uh, you know. So the way that that all worked with getting jiggy with it and him dancing in the videos and all of that, it just, all of those songs could have been corny, but thank God they weren't, man. They were big hits. Yeah. Big hits. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, Jazzy Jeff, you're one of many that have come under his camp, Dre and Vidal, yeah. Carvin and Ivan. Just take me back to that that era and what you learned yeah. from that. So, so yeah, once again, that, that's like late 90s, man. Late 90s yeah. down on, um, you know, 444 North 3rd Street, man. Studio 444, man. That was, yeah. that was, that was, that was college. You know what I mean? I actually dropped out of college to come wow. and work with Jeff because um, I got, I, was, I graduated high school and um, I went down to Grambling to try, you know, to go to college because that's what you're supposed to do, right? So yeah. I, I go to college for like a semester and quickly found out that that was not for me. And Dre and Vidal were actually sending me like beat tapes on cassette, like sending me beats and tracks and stuff they were working on. They were sending it down to, to Grambling. And they like, man, you should be up here. You should be with us. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the funny thing is I was in Grambling. Uh, I think my major, I was trying to take a major in like business or trying to, they didn't have any music business courses. And I was like, Ryan, why are you spending money trying to learn about the music business in college when you can just go be in the music business. Yeah. So I, I called my parents and I was like, I, I don't want to do this. And, you know, after one semester, you know what I mean? I packed up my stuff and I moved back to Jersey and I was in Philly. I was going to Jeff's studio every day for the next, you know, oh my God, three, four years, two, three years, you know what I mean? And just learning yeah. so much about recording and uh, developing your sound and writing, working with Carvin and Ivan working with Keith and Dee. I mean, the talent was crazy. A young Jill Scott was coming in and out singing on songs, you know. Uh, right. a, a young music soul child was coming in and out singing on songs. A young Glenn Lewis was singing, you know what I mean, flow with you. Yeah. Like, you know, we were all kids at that time. And just, you know, Jeff opened his doors and just let us come down there and get busy and just hone our craft, you know what I mean? So big shout out to Jazzy Jeff, man. He he opened the door for real. Yeah, and I feel like that time, that's when that that neo soul yeah. sound really, you know, started developing and being crafted. You know, when that sound was being crafted, like, did you get it right away? Because for us R and B listeners, when that first came out, that was like crazy to us. That sound. We, I mean, I thought it was dope. I mean, when you think yeah. about, I think one of the first like neo soul artists was D'Angelo. When D'Angelo yep. came, Brown Sugar. Yeah. It was a rap, you know. It was like, you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> you, you got this, you know, fly dude, hood looking dude with the with the with the cornrows going back, playing on the piano, sounding like Smokey Robinson and Prince, like singing yeah. about weed, smoking weed. <laughs> Mind blowing. So, you know, you had D'Angelo, I think Eric Badu, then Eric Badu comes with on and yeah. on. Um, you know, uh, and it just it just was it was phenomenal. That sound was crazy. Even Jeanne a little bit in the beginning, you know, their yeah. sound kind of lended toward the, you know, the development of the Neo Soul sound. So I was, I, we were on it right away. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I thought right. it was the hottest shit ever. <laughs> <laughs> and, and through that era, you were able to really develop a great working relationship, chemistry, production, and all of that with Dre and Vidal. Yeah. You guys, gone, you guys went ahead and did a lot of great work together. But what kind of clicked for you guys as a trio that you feel like really made it work? Honestly, so, well, really, you know, I, so I, like I said, I was signed there as an yeah. artist to his production company. And the goal was for me to record my album. And then, you know, Jeff and his his team would go and try to, you know, uh, secure me a record deal. Yeah. So, I, you know, I would come down there. Some days I'd be working with uh, just Vidal. Some days yeah. I'd be working with Carvin and, and, and D. Some days I'd be working with Keith and Ivan. Some days, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. yeah. we were all just down there, you know, mixing England, whatever. And then for whatever reason, it was just something about when I would come down there and like, me and Dre would get together by ourselves. We it just had a certain yeah. sound, just a certain I don't know. We just had a certain bop to it. It was just a certain bounce that we would create, like oh, you know. And then when I would get with Vidal, it would be the same thing. So right. I had great chemistry with the whole squad, but I don't know. And we were young. We were the young guys. We were the little brothers down. Oh. There. So we, we, you <laughs> yeah. know, me, Dre, and Vidal were like around the same age. So you know, what I mean, some of the other guys are older or whatever. So. You know what I mean? We just clicked on being the young, goofy ones in the crew, you know? Right. <laughs> and a lot of great hits to follow, but kind of take me through that timeline from that to City High. How did you get involved with City High? Because you went from being a solo artist to being a trio. Like, just yeah. take me through that. Uh, so, so the way City High came about, I was so 
once again working with Jeff. I just finished. We finished working on the Big Willie style project with Will, and um, and then like everything went back to normal. Will went back to L.A. It was like, yep. thanks a lot. You know what I mean? It was fun. You know, and and it, I remember it was toward the end of the year. I want to say ninety eight. So around November ninety eight. So yeah. around that time is the fourth quarter in the music business, and normally record labels shut down. They're not signing any new acts. They're not opening up any new any new budgets until like the top of the year. So I couldn't get a record deal. Record labels were shutting down. It was the holiday season. It was nothing but Christmas music on the radio. So um, it was just kind of like, okay, what now? You know what I mean? The Will Smith album hadn't come. It wasn't coming out for a while, and I was just like, okay, what now? You know. Um, and I, I ran into an old manager, my first manager, actually, a guy named Marvin Thompson. I ran into him. We hadn't seen each other since I did Sister Act 2. And uh, he was just like, you know, hey, man, how you been? What you been up to? What you working on? And I told him. And then he uh, he told me he was working with this young kid named Robbie from right. who went to my high school. He was like, yeah, Yo, you might know him. Robbie came up two years younger than me, though. So I had already graduated mm -hmm. when Robbie was like, you know, junior senior in high school i was gone by then but i remembered him i remembered him you know uh from from high school so i said yeah i remember him so um he was like yeah man um i'm, I'm managing this kid now and wyclef just signed him and why wow. wyclef has a new label with his cousin jerry wonder called book of basement on interscope yep. so he was like you know uh they're working on his project right now you should come do some writing for him so i was like all right cool so robbie and i linked I started writing with him. We started doing a bunch of collaborations for his solo project, actually. Mm -hmm. And okay. then, um, but one day um, I went to the studio with him uh, to, to go, he had to go do some vocals on My Love Is Your Love. Wyclef was working on Whitney Houston's My Love Is Your Love. Okay. And so Robbie was like, yo, let's go to the studio. So when we went to the studio, I, when I walked in the room, Wyclef went crazy because he remembered me through Lauren Hill from System mm -hmm. 2. So right. all the dots connected. And so Wyclef was like, oh, my God, yo, what's up, bro? Like, you know what I mean? So we started rapping, whatever. He, he, he was like, yo, you should go in the booth, do some vocals on this Whitney Houston song for me. So I did some background vocals and some stuff on that record. And we just were chopping it up. And Clef was like, yo, man, what, what you doing now? What you up to? I told him my situation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and now, mind you, the Will Smith album hadn't come out yet. So we didn't know if that album was going to yeah. blow up. We didn't know if it was a waste of time. I was yeah. just like, yo, I did all these songs for Will Smith. I don't know what's going to happen. He was right. like, oh, man, you know? So Clef was like, well, he said, man, we just got a new label. Jerry and I called Booger Basement. And he was like, uh, plus, man, all the songs you've been doing with Robbie, he was like, y'all got such a chemistry. He was like, why don't you come and, you know, be down with us? Come get on our yeah. team. Nice. And my contract was up with Jeff at that point. So I was no longer signed to Jazzy Jeff. So I was, you know, I needed the money, man. I was in, I was in a tight yeah. situation, you know what I mean? And and so he was like, you know, you and Robbie can be like the new young Casey and Jojo. Wow. <laughs> so, so City High originally started as a duo. It was just mm -hmm. Robbie and me. And, yeah. um, and, and Claudette was just like featuring on some of our hooks. That's why she's just singing on the chorus of what would you do? She was almost mm -hmm. like just a feature. Yeah. So, but uh, when Wyclef and Jerry and all of them heard her voice, obviously they, they went crazy. Then when they yep. saw her, they fell in love with her. And they were like, yo, we got to put her in the group. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it's like, we went from being the new Casey and Jojo to like, oh, y'all could be the new Fugees, you know what I mean? So, right. so then, you know, that was the whole play. And then uh, she joined the group and, and then we started recording the album. Wow. I mean, take me through recording that album. You did a lot of writing on that album, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you did a great job. And then I think the writing on it, it, it was just so different. Like you had topics and even yeah. concepts that we hadn't never really heard about, like even Caramel, for example, or what would you do? Like, what was your mind frame at that time? Uh, to be honest with you, I was in this place creatively of like, like it was during, you know, the Neo Soul era and stuff like that. And it was just a lot of love songs, a lot of love songs, you know, love, love this, love that, love this, love yep. that. And I just, I wanted to, I, I was, I, I was, I wanted to write about the dark side of love. I wanted to write about the other side of love, you know, like the, the shitty, right. the shitty side, you know what I mean? The not so cool <laughs> yep. side, you know, when things go wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, so I just, you know the concepts were just dark and but what what the contrast was like dark concept happy music so you know what would you do is like this hey, what would you do? 
it's all upbeat and happy, but it's sad. Yeah. It's the saddest story ever. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so yeah, it was just it was just me trying to be different and just kind of wanting to set myself apart from what everybody else was doing, you know, on the radio and just kind of yeah. explore another emotion and another feeling. That's all. Yeah, like when I listen to a song like Cats and Dogs, and yeah. then I look at just like the talent of you guys as a trio, and obviously Claudette's voice and your yeah. guys' writing as well as your vocal. I feel like there was so much potential there yeah. that oh, went on yeah. top. Like when you look back at that, like how much potential, if, if you're an A&R today and you're looking at that group, like how much potential is there that you feel like I mean, was on top? Flat out, man, we were the Black Eyed Peas before the Black Eyed Peas, bro. I yeah. mean, like, like the, I, and I'm talking Black Eyed Peas pre-Fergie. You feel what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yeah. we, we were even on tour with them. Wyclef took us on tour, uh, and it was, it was, I think it was the MTV Campus Invasion Tour or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was Wyclef, De La Soul, and, and, and Bla the Black Eyed Peas. But this was the Black Eyed Peas. They were still backpack rappers. They were break dancers. They didn't have a girl in the group, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and so <clears throat> we were kind of like, we were developing this this sound of like, this sort of like pop edgy sound. We were doing that way before them, you know what yep. I mean? And um, and yeah, we, I, and, and it's so funny cause we even had, you know, like the song like City High Anthem and like all these mm -hmm. other, other yeah. songs. And then, you know, as soon as our group, and we were signed to the same label, mind you, Jimmy Iovine is a very smart wow. guy. We were signed yeah. to Interscope. So, when when City High went bust, he was like, he looked at his next best thing. He's got these three dancing dudes. He threw a pretty girl in their group and they, where is the love? And like everything, <laughs> their whole sound just shifted. Their whole, they, everything about them went super pop. They went from being underground, backpack, break dancing guys to like dancing pop, you know what I mean? Super mainstream guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so after that City High album goes, uh, comes out, doesn't sell as much as you probably would have liked it to. Mm. You know, you go on to start writing. Like, take me through that timeline. Was was there plans of a second City High album, or just talk about that? Yeah, well, I mean, the album went gold plus. We sold we sold just shy of a million records, so we did right. well. You know what I mean? We yeah. did really well. Um, we had a we had a, a number one selling single in the country. Uh, yeah. You know, there was a there was for like two weeks we were like beating Janet Jackson. So you know what I mean? We were doing yeah. we were doing really really well, bro. Um, we, you know, and we were nominated for a Grammy. I mean, and we, we lost to Destiny's Child Survivor. So that's not, yeah. that's not too bad, you know? Right. <laughs> um, so now, nah, I mean, the group was, was doing fine and we were all excited to get, get back in and do a second album. And we, we actually did start recording a lot of songs. Mm -hmm. We did a second album. Okay. It wasn't as good as the first album. It was a little rushed. Um, uh, obviously, you know, there was, there was some turmoil in the group. And so the chemistry and the vibe was off and it just wasn't the same. So we just all decided, you know, you know, just right. to walk away, walk away while you, <laughs> while you still can. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, Ryan, talk about this then. You had a solo deal before City High. City High blows up. You guys have hit records and now it's back to start for you, you know, as a solo artist. Like, what was that? situation like was that was that a hard time for you or was it just on to the next thing well the the the, the, the i didn't have a solo deal so okay. that was the thing i got into this business yeah. 28 years ago to have my solo career that was the whole point right. i want to be like yeah. the r&b singing guy solo guy yeah. and you know the universe just saw fit to have me do everything but that <laughs> <laughs> i mean i was in a movie that became a cult classic I was in a group that was Grammy nominated and toured the world. Yeah. I mean, I worked with the biggest and the best artists on the writing side. I was on two albums. I was a part of two albums that uh, sold in excess of 20 million records. You know what I mean? Yeah. Twice. You know what I mean? So, and, and, and just a slew of other uh, uh, writing opportunities with different artists. So, you know, at that time, once the group dissolved, yeah. I, I, I went back to what I knew. And what I knew was my pen. I knew I could write. Mm, yeah. So I, I just, and and honestly, it it circled full circle back to Dre and Vidal. I remember right. I remember when the group was like on its last leg and it, and it was looking like the second album just wasn't gonna, you know, come to fruition. Yeah. I got a call from Dre and I hadn't talked to Dre and Vidal since I left uh, Jazzy Jeff and went with right. Wyclef. So um, some years had gone by and, and I got a call from Dre 
and we chopped it up. Yo, what's up, bro? How you been? And at that time, at that point, they had left Jazzy Jeff as well, and they were doing their own thing. So Dre, I remember, man, I remember like it was yesterday. Dre was like, uh, he was like, yo, man, I just got this new crib. He was like, um, I got the studio in the house. He was like, um, he was like, just come stay at the house, bro. Just come to the crib, stay at the house, and let's just cook up like we used to. Let's just mm -hmm. let's just do it like we used to. Right. So I went down to Philly. And uh, I stayed I stayed at his crib and just hung out for like a week and uh, just spent some good bro time. And we started working on some ideas. And you know what was the first idea that Dre and I came up with after all these years of not seeing each other? The first idea, the very first one. You know what it was? What was it? What was it? it was Superstar. That wow. ended up on Usher's uh, album. Wow. That was the first idea we came up with was Superstar. And I remember recording... Um, I remember recording, somebody said Studio 609. Nah, this is way before the Studio 609 days. So um, I, and I, I recorded the reference for Superstar on this wow. little eight track digital recorder thing that Dre had up in his loft at, at, in his apartment with just this little handheld Shure mic. And I just sat there and oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> like all the riffs that you hear Usher do on that album, on that song, he, yeah. he copied me. Line for line, I sang the whole thing. Spotlight these days, fifty thousand wow. fans screaming in a rage, and I and I recorded it on there. And Dre was like, "Yo, man, that shit's dope." He said, "I think that shit'll be dope for Usher." And I was like, "Yeah." And he was like, "Yeah, man." He said, "You know, we've been uh." He said, "We got a really good relationship with L.A. Reid right now. I'm gonna send it to L.A. Reid." I said, mm. "All right." I said, "Cool." And and uh, so you know, after we spent that that weekend together, um, I, I I lived in Miami at the time, so I went back home to Miami. And uh, I got a call, like, maybe, like, a week later. And Dre was like, yo, man, uh, L.A. Reid loves that song for Usher. He's going to fly us all to Atlanta to go record it on him. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so we all we all went to Atlanta. And uh, that was the first song we recorded with Usher that ended up, you know, going on the Confessions album. That was one of about five songs that we did. Not of the five, three landed on that album. Right. Yeah, that song right there. Like, we made a post the other day. It was like, take one song off the Confessions album. Yeah, I could. saw that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that song is staying on there. You can take the other one, though, but that one stays on there. And then just like Faith Evans on that bridge. Yeah. But... Like, I didn't even notice it was uh, it was Faith until like recently, but when I listened to it, it, it added like another dimension oh, to the man, song. That crazy. Faith, Faith, you know, Faith has known Usher since he was super young. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because uh, Usher used to record with, with, with Puff Daddy. But back in the Puff Daddy, that's you know what I mean. Back when he was called Puff Daddy, uh, Usher Usher was recording with him, and uh, so Faith and Usher had a had a great relationship. She was like yeah. a big sis to him, and uh, she she was just I think she was just at the studio one day. She might even she might have been working in another room or something, and yeah. um, you know we just chopping it up, whatever, whatever. And it was like, Yo, Faith, you you want to sing on this record? Can you give us some vocals on this record? And she went in the booth, man, and just whew, like one take, she just bodied it. Smash wow. it, man. Yes, man. Like, oh my God. One of the dopest voices I've ever heard in my life, bro. Yeah. Now the now you did have a single on that album, Caught Up. That was a big single. Yeah. I gotta ask, being that Confessions is a diamond selling album yeah. and you had a single on that album, how much was your royalty check for that? That must have been crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, let let's let's just say it's it's funny because on the Will Smith uh, album that album right. sold, that album sold about that's a lot right? yep. worldwide, and I didn't have a publishing deal. Oh wow! Yeah, and and but then on the Usher album, that album sold about twenty plus million worldwide, and I did have a publishing deal. But I'll just say, one was a little bigger than the other, but they were both, <laughs> they were both pretty big. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah, oh, and then of course you have the record "Follow Me." I love that song too. That yeah. was a great one. Yeah. We, originally, we originally wrote that for Mario. Mario recorded that. Wow. First, yeah. Mm. And Mario, he crushed that record, bro. And wow. uh, but, but Mario's team at the time, they, I don't know, they they weren't feeling it. And so uh, Mario loved it, but you know his team, mm -hmm. his team wasn't 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 feeling it. So, you know what I mean? We gave it. We turned around and you know played it for Usher. Just played Usher my you know my reference version. Right. Usher was like, hell yeah. But by that time, our relationship with Usher was like this. He was trusting mm -hmm. us. He was recording whatever we was throwing at him. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so he heard that song. He loved it. Of course, Usher killed it, did his thing on it. And it's it's a funny story, man. I remember I was on a flight. I was getting off a flight in New York at JFK Airport. And uh, 
I'm walking off the first class. No, I'm walking from the back of the plane. And as I'm walking up through first class, as I'm coming out, Mario is standing right there. Like, you know what I'm saying? In first class or whatever. And he looked at me, you know what I mean? I looked at him and he was just like, he started singing it. Come follow me, come follow me, come follow me now. <laughs> he was like, man, I'm so fucking mad. I didn't get that song. He was mad, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, man. And then there was another song you guys did during that era for Amory, Just Like Me. That's one of my favorites by her. Yeah, like, yeah. just the vibe of that song and just, yeah. man, it sounds great. Somebody just like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah man. Me, man, Pooh Bear, me and Pooh Bear, man, we were just a dynamite team, man. That's my dog, man. We were just, we were going ham during that time, man. We were just having a good time. Yeah, I mean, so many great hits, so many great records here. Uh, just kind of take me then through to, you know, you reemerging as a solo artist. Yeah. Years later, like, Take yeah. me through that timeline. So, I mean, yeah, so I, I guess to the, the, the quick story, uh, you know, the short of it is, so after that, man, I just started writing for any, I mean, everybody, you know what I mean? Anybody, you know, Mary J. Blige and Justin Bieber, Chris Brown, Genuine, Tyrese, you know, LL Cool J, yeah. Lionel Richie, like 112, you name it. I was writing for everybody. Yeah. And that just went on for years and years and years and years. And... Fast forward to now, um, I, I'm just in a place in my life where I'm, I'm almost 29 years in the game professionally. Yeah. I almost got 30 years in the game. That's a long time. So I'm just, you know, I guess like anybody, you know, after 30 years on a certain job, you just start saying like, okay, what else is there? Like, you know, is this yeah. it? Like, what else should I be doing? You start looking for what else, you know, is, 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 does God have anything else for you or is this it? And so I just wanted to give myself a new challenge and um, basically go back to square one. I'm like, well, Ryan, you kind of checked everything off your bucket list except that solo project, you know, that 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 you started out doing, you know, yeah. that you wanted to do. And so I just told myself, I got to do it. I have to check it off my bucket list before I check out of here. You know what I mean? I got to say, you know what? I released my solo project. I, I did my videos. I, I did some shows. I went on tour. I did it. You know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. it's for yeah. me. So really, this my song for the lockdown series, man. It's really for me, bro. To be quite honest, yeah. it, it, it's me going back to being that young, you know, fourteen-year-old kid that wanted to stand on stage by himself and sing his songs and make his videos and just be that cool little fly R&B kid. It's it's just something I had to go back to. Sometimes you just got to go back to square one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I forgot a song that you wrote earlier, and uh, I just got to highlight it because it's one of my favorites. It's actually an unreleased song, but the song you did for Claudette, Simply Amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one's a, that's an amazing record. I don't know why it didn't come out, <laughs> but that song is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you. But, I mean, your solo music now, like, just talk about the following that you've created and that you've had, like, a, lo a lot of R&B fans, they'll know you and they'll recognize your name. Do you find that they've followed you since, you know, your days of City High? Are, yeah. are they rediscovering you? Like, just talk about yeah. that. Yes, absolutely, man. I mean, people know me from, you know, I'm a part of their childhood. You know what I mean? They know yeah. me. It, the dawn of it is Sister Act 2. You know, the Oh Happy yeah. Day moment is just like a moment that lives in, in history with people. I mean, people tell me all the time bro, I grew up watching you. I learned how to sing watching you. You know, I, every every year at my school Christmas recital, I had to sing your part in the in the school play. I had to sing Oh Happy Day or whatever, you know. So people have been telling me this for years. Um, yeah. And obviously, yes, the City High stuff as well. And then, um, and but, and then people just feel, they didn't know what happened to me. They like, you know, and then mm -hmm. you disappeared. They didn't know I was behind the scenes crafting hits right. for other artists. They didn't know right. That they had been singing along with my songs this whole time you know it's just that you know other artists were singing them so i felt like right. i feel like i owe it to my fans to let them know like hey no i'm still here i'm still good like i didn't fall off the map i'm not dead i actually been here the whole time i was just the mac in the back you know what i mean i was just right. the man behind the man you know so i'm just in a place now too where i'm like i want to give those fans reintroduce myself to the ones who knew me and loved me and then introduce myself to this whole new slew of youngsters that don't know who I am. And they're just looking yep. at it like, yo, you just got some dope ass music. You know what I mean? Right. So I'm like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm gonna creep in and, and just kind of like be that new underground to, to the new fans. I'm just some new 
underground artists with some cool music. And to the old fans, it's like, oh my God, it's like a, it's like a family member you haven't seen in a long time. Like, yo, shit, what's up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> right. I love it. Yeah. So Ryan, I got to ask you this, because you've written so many hits. I've got two questions for you. Number one, what is your songwriting process? And number two, because I know you wrote this song, what would Jodeci do? <laughs> that record that you did for Tank? I got to know. <laughs> Well, let's go with the writing process first. <laughs> ah, that's a good question. Um, my writing process is is simple, man. I, I I write what's around me. I'm 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 just a sponge for information. Um, I love good conversation. Uh, I like people that just know how. I, I like when people express themselves. Um, also, also, I, I might pick up ideas from a film I saw. I might have heard a cool line somebody say in a movie, and I'm like, wow, that would be a dope song, you know? Or or it could just be something I I heard in passing. I could be in a grocery store, and I'm listening to two people have a conversation, and somebody says, you know, says something like, you know, man, you need to back up, give me six feet. And I'm like, oh, I need to write a song called Six Feet, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> like, I'm, I, I just soak up my environment. I soak up everything around me, and then I use it and translate it, obviously put my little spin on it. Um, I have a really, really big imagination. I always have had a big imagination since I was a kid. I know how yeah. to craft stories. I know how to create worlds with my words um, that, that, that you can get fully immersed in. Like, I'll give you an example. Here's a little fun fact. When I wrote Miami for Will Smith, I had never been to Miami. Mm. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And um, I, I, that, was based, that was just he and I in the studio. And, like, our process used to be you know, because he had a new young girlfriend named Jada. So he, yeah. he didn't want to be in the studio all day. He wanted to go kick it with his girl. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like any guy with a new pretty girlfriend, right? Yeah. So he would come He would come to the studio, hear the track. He would pick pick whatever track he wanted. And then uh, he, we would just chop it up about a concept. Like, yo, man, I think I think we should do a song about this. Or I think we should do a song. And, and that particular day, he was like, we should do a song about a real dope ass city. So I was like, all right, like, I was like, well, what, what cities you been to? What cities you like? And he's like, yo, like, Paris is crazy, man. He's talking about Paris. And then he's talking about London. He's talking about, right. you know, Dubai and New York and Australia, Sydney, Australia and Tokyo, you know. And um, then he's like, no, nah, you know what? We should write about Miami. And I was like, yeah. yeah. And he was just like, yeah, what, man? And he's just talking. He's like, Miami, yep. man, what the, the girls and the, and like, yo, I remember I went to Sylvester Stallone's house and the little guy, <laughs> you know, he's just telling me, man, people got yachts and boats and, and I've never been to Miami. I'm just listening to him just tell a cool little wow. story. And then he was like, yeah, so he was like, I don't know, young boy, something like that. And he just like taps me on the shoulder and he bounces like, I'll be back. And he's going to lunch with his girl. And yep. he would just leave me in the studio. And, wow. and, and so I would just be in the studio with whatever he may have just talked about. And I, I crafted the whole, here I am in the place where it comes that low, in Miami, the, 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 wow. that low. Every day is like a Mardi Gras, everybody party all day, no work, golf play, okay? So we took a little son, leave the rest of the spell, me and Charlie got the ball running up a high bill. Like, dang, I bodied that shit, boy. Like, I, you know what I mean? And and I just I just go hard, man. I really, I go hard, man. It's, it's I'm God gifted, you know? I really, really thank God. It just comes, it flows like that, and you know, and obviously, I wanted to impress Will, you know, so I knew I had, mm -hmm. I knew I had to kill it. So that's really yeah. my process, man. I just go within. I, I soak up what's around me. And then I go within. I always try to listen to the vibe, you know, try to be obedient to the vibration of the song. I don't try to be too heady and like, oh, I need to make it like this. I try to get out of my own way and just let the spirit of the music take me where it wants to take me. And then I just add the words to what the music is already saying. I, I'm a firm believer that the music is already telling a story. Yep. I'm, I'm just the translator. I got to translate it into English. You, wow. you, you understand what I'm saying? So yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, that's that's that process. And as far as the Jodeci, what would you? <laughs> yeah, I got to know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, Jodeci is Jodeci would. Let me tell you something about Jodeci, man. Like, hands down, like the. The greatest R and B group, like okay. as far as yep. hip hop and R and B, the ninety, yep. like as far as what yep. we know as hip hop R and B, what we yep. know now, like the because there was a time where rap and 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 R and B were separate. They were they were yep. separate entities. You know, you had like Anita Baker and Luther Vandross and Whitney Houston, and then you had you know Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre. Like that was separate. 
But like yep. Puff Daddy, Andre Harrell, you know, big shout out to Andre Harrell, them coming along and Mur Teddy Riley, them merging hip hop and R and B and that fusion of that sound where it's a little bit rap and it's a little bit singing and it's a little bit funk and it's a little bit hip hop. Yep. Jodeci is the all time number one group of that period. Yep. From the yep. hard ass Devante production beats. I mean, you got Stevie J was doing some of those beats playing guitar. You had Timbaland that was doing yep. some of those beats playing guitar. You had Missy that was like writing some of those hooks. You had Static Major, nigga. Are you crazy? Like Jodeci. Yep. So what would Jodeci do? They would crush it. Jodeci. <laughs> We'll put on some leather jackets with no shirts and tattoos with some fucking big ass boots and glasses on, and they just gonna fucking thug love you to death. <laughs> <laughs> you feel me? Like yeah. and you know, I, I got a chance to be around Devontae and 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 wow. see a little bit of his process and like the greatest ever, man. The greatest ever, the greatest ever. Wow. Every look at how many groups copied them after. Yep. Look at how yep. many songs artists, even rappers, reference Jodeci. I just did a song and I referenced Jodeci. Like, how many, you know what I mean? Artists reference Jodeci in their music. Like, you know? You yeah, just, got, it, it, just got me hyped, man, thinking about Jodeci. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's crazy because, like, when we look at the hits and the numbers, Boys to Men sold more, but Jodeci today has the bigger impact and influence. It's crazy. It, it, so, Check this out. It's just like I told you, like with the sister act, the first one versus the second yep. one. The first one was the bigger hit numbers wise, but the second yep. one became more of the cult classic amongst our age group and the young generation of singers and people tra coming up. You know, understand what I'm saying? It became more because why? Because it was cooler. You had the young yep. cool kids in there. And we like dancing and rapping, and you had Lauren, a young Lauren Hill. Like, come on, fam. Like, you yep. know what I mean? So, <laughs> so it's different. So, I mean, and shout out to boys and men. I know. A few of them oh, yeah. personally, you know, and of course yep. they 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 had numbers through the roof. Nobody's touching boys and men's numbers, but it's almost like the difference between Michael Jackson and Prince. You know, yep. Michael, yep. of course, is Michael, but Prince just had a whole other thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it just kind of yep. is what it is. That's an amazing thing, well, Ryan. Man, we're looking forward to everything that you've got going on. People got to check out that music that you've been playing. You've been playing out a lot during this quarantine sec session. It's it's crazy, actually. Yeah, I've been, I've, been drop, I've been dropping an album every week. I wanted to do something different. So once again, I'm like just setting a goal for myself. To, I got to do something to set myself apart. Every, you know, yep. any artist can just drop a song. Hey, check out my new single for the quarantine. You know, yep. but or they can drop an EP or drop an album. I'm like, nah. What has no one done? I was like, no one has done an album a week, every week. And right. so I just wanted to set the high bar and just immediately set myself apart. Because if I'm going to reemerge into the game as an artist yep. now, I got to go hard. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't fuck around with it. Like, I got to go hard. I got to, like, let people know, like, no, nah, I'm really, really, really about this life, you know? Yeah. I mean, volume is one thing, but quality is another. And you're delivering the quality. So I'm thankful for that. But, Ryan, just the last question. We're almost out of time here. But... You know, re-emerging as a solo artist, you said that was something that you wanted to check off as one of your personal goals in terms of expectations with the way the music industry is now. Like, what are the expectations for your solo career? Well, the first thing I did was detach from the concept of being in the music industry. The world mm -hmm. is changing. The world is yep. changing. And, you know, I even made an announcement like, you know, I I'm no longer a recording artist. I'm a content creator. You know, oh, wow. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I, I just create content. I mean, look at someone like yourself, like, you know, back yeah. in the day, you would have had to go work for NBC or Fox yep. News, or you would have had to work for a radio station to be able to be a, a, a top level journalist. Right. Yeah. But now we have this is we're in a new paradigm where you can do these podcasts and these. Uh, this is a whole nother paradigm where now you're interviewing yeah. me and you're you have your own follow. You're your own Fox News. You're your own CNN. You understand True. what I'm saying? So. Yep. I'm just taking advantage of the fact that we're in a brand new paradigm and it's not about being in the recording industry or having any, I have no expectations of the, for the recording industry because to me, right. the recording industry is about to be over. There aren't going to mm. be any big major concerts. No artists are going on tour. There's not going to be a sold out staple center yep. for God knows how long. So right. what does that mean now? Now everybody's tuning in to watch 
the Teddy Riley and, and Babyface battle and the Jill yep. Scott and, 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 and you know and Erica Badu battle. That's that's the big thing everybody's tuning in to watch now. Everybody's yep. tuning in to watch DJ D Nice. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. so, it's a whole new day now, bro. So I'm a part of this new wave. I'm a part of this new culture. I'm not thinking about the old shit in the record industry and all of that because the record right. industry would have told me at 43 years old I can't put out an album. Mm, yep. But the internet is like, we don't give a fuck. Give us that shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, so for me, uh, my expectation is in, is in you, your generation, mm -hmm. the youth, the right. millennials. You guys have a whole other perspective. You guys have, you don't see it the way that the old dinosaur record executives see it. You guys right. see it a whole other way. You guys have a can-do, will-do, DYI, do-it-yourself mentality. And right. the type of technology that you have with the cell phone, it, yep. Steve Jobs created this for you guys because you guys don't give a fuck. You're going to go hard. You're going to do it in, in, out of your bedroom. So I was like, right. you know what? I'm going to think like them. You see what yeah. I'm saying? I don't want to think yeah. like the old guy. I want to think like the new young guys, bro. So, you know, I'm I'm yeah. I'm going hard, and it's blowing up, and the, and the love, and the respect, and and the and the uh, the support has just been crazy, and it's only getting bigger, and it's about to get real big, fam. Trust me, the numbers are that, high. That, <laughs> that's, that's really inspiring, and you know, just to add to that, it's like readjust readjusting your mindset to what a millennial thinks is great, but you still have the talent and what you've learned from before all of this came along. And when you put that together, I think, it, I think it's just exactly. an amazing thing, man. Exactly. So, <laughs> so Ryan, we're out of time here, but I just want to let you know, you've got our support. So just keep us posted on everything you've got going on Thank and uh, just man. keep really putting out great music, man. Thank you so much for having me, man. Thank me for, thank you for having me on your platform. It means way more than you know. And, uh, Volume 7 drops tonight at midnight. Songs for the Lockdown Volume 7 drops tonight at midnight. Nice. Check that out, guys. And yep. thanks once again, Ryan. All right, man. Thank you, bro. Yep.